But secondly, um, when you talk about markets, when people ask the question in your way, I'm not attributing this to you, but people frequently do, they forget about the fact that the, the intense and, in fact, effort to completely regulate these substances does drive the price up dramatically. You'd have a lot more consumption if these were actually sold at the price that they could be produced at. And again, we have 20 million Americans is the best data, it's not perfect, government has that use an illegal drug once a month or more frequently. We have 60 million who smoke a cigarette, regulated market brought, that is taxed, and we have 120 million Americans who use alcohol once a month or more frequently. Now my argument is, if you look at that, I think that's a strong argument that prohibition works. I mean, what would the country be like with 60 million people? And the, and the argument that's come back and forth that I just want to touch on is the marijuana. And the one comment about, well, what about, you know, just a small amount or one person around. We would not be talking about marijuana if that were the problem. Half of the people who need treatment for substance abuse and dependency in the United States for all illegal drugs are dependent on marijuana based on the best evidence we have. And if you go back to individuals in treatment, marijuana is the single biggest cause of treatment need by a factor of multiples in the United States. It is in the bodies of more people who are arrested for other crimes. Mm -hmm. So it contributes to some of that out of controlness that you see with alcohol and other drugs. Marijuana is thought not to be a serious drug, which probably is one of the reasons why it's used more. But the fact is, today's marijuana, the consequences of marijuana, the marijuana tied to other substances and other behavior, including uh, family abuse, is an enormously under understood factor, and it's not why people are going to jail. Many of these possession cases and drug cases, in fact, the incarceration rate's going down in, in, in the actual numbers. And most of the people going into, the, uh, into prisons that may have a possession charge actually were arrested for something like assault, battery, or something else, and they had the substance on them, and it's easier to adjudicate them and knock down the sentence and not have to go to trial for the possession charge. So, the, the, again, there's been a repetition of the argument, we're locking up too many people. And uh, even a reference by my colleague to the Rockefeller laws in New York. The Rockefeller laws in New York came into existence after New York first tried to weaken the laws and had a horrendous result, so it went the other way. Again, you can modify the amount of sentencing, you can change the penalties to some degree, but the fact of the matter is, these are substances that take away freedom. They're a unique problem. So if you care about freedom, you can't confuse the right to use these with a defense of freedom. It's a defense of the slavery of addiction and alcoholism. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question you, about... Can, can I just follow oh, that up? Sure, I, sure. I, I, I drink um, uh, red wine with dinner uh, most evenings. Um, that's my drug of choice. Um, uh, do I understand correctly that you would um, suggest that I should be arrested and imprisoned um, for that offense? No, but again, again, I think, but I, but I do think you bring up a point that you may not intend. We went back and forth on alcohol. We pay a big price for illegal alcohol. I mean, some of you that are prosecutors know the, the, the problem that alcohol brings in terms of behavior of individuals, in terms of the, think of the family members who have lost uh, their lives or had their lives go out of control or had to regain their lives. We are, we are paying a real price for alcohol. We shouldn't pretend it's not. We've decided not to make it illegal, as we did once in the past, for the sale, not for consumption, I'll point out. But the fact of the matter is, I think there's also a massive difference between alcohol and crack, or alcohol and meth, and even alcohol and marijuana, if you look at the consequences of use versus dependency. And if you don't look at the specifics here, if you use the kind of, well, we're, we're, we're children of the 60s or yeah, 70s, uh, Mr. and Walters, marijuana's not serious, you're really living in a fantasy world. Mr. Walters, I have to say something to you. Um, the programs that I used uh, for children in the schools, like the DARE program, which costs um, a billion to a billion, three hundred million dollars a year, are notoriously ineffective. The National Academy of Sciences has said so, the American Medical Association has said so, Every, the Government Accountability um, Office has said so, everybody says so. And it seems to me that you have just indicated why they are so ineffective. And they are so ineffective because no one believes you when you say things like that. No one takes you seriously when you talk about marijuana dependency. Children in schools don't take you seriously, and therefore they go out and use the drugs because you so exaggerate the consequences um, that 
uh, you, you are counterproductive when you do that. And those programs are counterproductive. You exemplify the counterproductive quality of most of the effort to educate uh, about drugs. Let, 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 let me take a moderate position here. Um, <laughs> I actually was on a school board when we were reviewing these programs, and they were all funded by the federal government, and a lot of them were worthless from experience. But there were one or two that were really very good. There, so are, the, there are some. The, so there's a lot of overgeneralization, yeah. and the point no, you're was, right. rather than listening to whatever salesperson there was from the nonprofit that had been funded to study this thing that an academic came up with. It was the parents and the teachers who figured out what does and doesn't work. They can use some assistance, but again, I say that those who are most interested in how their children are raised are the ones that are going to put the most responsibility into it. But look, th there's good prevention and there's bad prevention. And no prevention program in the classroom is a substitute for the larger education that society gives, some of which is pernicious. But again, those debating points may work with the people who are drinking wine with you. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the actual attitude of young people over the last five, 10 years, they've changed and seen marijuana as more serious, partly because of education, including federally funded advertising that they see, but also because they see among their peers and their friends the consequences of that use. And they know it makes their lives more difficult, more out of control, less successful. Being a doper today compared to when we were children is not considered to be cool or a mark of success. It's seen by most young people as being a loser. That's a good thing. Thank it you. It is, but I'm not sure the federal government brought that about. I didn't say the federal, the federal government can contribute. The federal government can contribute or it can undermine. I, I'm but many people have to contribute. I'm determined to get two more questions from the audience and before we conclude. Yes, sir. Sure, thank you. I have a question about uh, federal guidelines for sentencing and uh, disparities between crack cocaine and powder cocaine. Uh, the, I think the threshold right now is about 100 to 1 in terms of the difference between a trafficker and uh, a user, so, so, something like that. Uh, do the panelists think that this creates uh, a perverse incentive for law enforcement to go after end users and relatively small users, which, which are still culpable, but as opposed to going after large wholesalers and sort of criminal masterminds or organized crime? Anybody want to respond? Um, I don't favor the disparity. I don't think it creates a perverse incentive. In fact, I've both written and I worked at the end of the administration to, to try to get Congress to remove the differential between crack and powder and to insert into the law a provision that the harsher sentence for just cocaine, cocaine, whether, whatever form it was in, be applied at the low level only if someone was, has previously been convicted of one violent felony or, 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 or three or more um, uh, nonviolent felonies. Now the reason for that is, contrary to what I know the propaganda is out there that people are slam dunking choir boys that just have to have a couple of rocks on their way to choir practice, that's not actually what's going on. But there is the use of the federal guideline in some areas to go after extremely violent individuals and violent gangs in places where local law enforcement has been or believes it's been overrun by bringing in federal authority. The goal was to allow the federal government to be of assistance in critical, urgent areas like that, the, my proposal, or the proposal the Bush administration floated but did not get done, um, against, to, to allow the federal uh, law enforcement, something obviously my colleague would be opposed to, to no, come in and go after so-called so so -called violent uh, uh, drug dealing uh, individuals but because of the violent danger or the gang danger that is, that is particularly focused. So it, essentially it allows what is the common practice, contrary to the cartoon version. And it, uh, uh, but nonetheless, it, uh, um, it, I think, addresses what is, I think, a serious issue, which is the perception that the law is racially unjust when it comes to crack and powder. It wasn't created that way. Charlie Ranger was a co-sponsor of it, as was the current vice president, as was uh, Senator Leahy. Nobody thinks that they're, you know, institutional racist. And it went after the people who were selling this to people who were considered vulnerable in our inner cities. The problem is. We didn't solve the problem, and we've had, we've had a feeling that it's been used in a way that's racially disparate. I think the law should not only be just, it needs where it can be to be perceived as just, and we could fix this. The problem is the sentencing guidelines and their unconstitutionality. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's been declared. What's that? <laughs> so it's been declared. Yes, sir. 